Good morning, everybody. This is Coach Reese and Coach Loretta, and we are coming at you today with Coffee with Coaches, where we talk about training, aid stations, um, everything that has to do with our races. So we um, are with Ordering Mule Racing, where we like to spread kindness and community through, um, you know, uh, uh, enjoyment of races and happiness and whatnot. So, but we like to particularly train or speak about the training aspect of ultra marathons. Um, so coach Loretta, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm doing pretty well. I just got back from, um, a nice long run. It's pretty much like my last big one before earth day. So everything went pretty well. And I was super glad to be outside at veteran acres this morning, ran into a couple friends, um, on the trail, um, shout out to Will. He's always a great guy. And I saw him right at the tail end of my run. So it was nice to have somebody to run into the finish with. Um, so he should still be out there right now, but, um, yeah, other than that, just got home. So I'm still in my windbreaker and still my hat and everything. So I'm glad you guys can't smell me over the internet, but, uh, we're here. We're excited. How about you? Well, I started um, with a few mile run this morning and I was kind of holding out till sunshine. So I'll be running um, after this podcast. I'll be going out to the trail. Oh, fantastic. Um, you know, today's topic being about aid stations and aid station efficiency, I think is going to be a really fun one. And I think this is part of our race strategy as ultra marathoners. So, you know, we all love to go out there and run and run long and have a great time and put our fuel in our packs and get geared up and get ready to go. Um, but a critical component to, you know, having a smooth strategic race is not spending a ton of time at aid stations, right? Like we've always, or we've all heard of those stories of people, um, you know, napping at an aid station for an hour or two and, um, you know, uh, tacking on a lot of time with a bunch of aid station stops. Let's say you're running hundred miles and there's 15 aid stations. If you're spending 20 to 30 minutes at each aid station, you are packing on a lot of time to your finishing result. And if you know that it's going to be close anyways, this is a great area that you can trim off some, some time without necessarily gaining any fitness, right? Ultra marathons uh, take a lot of fitness, they take a lot of durability, but they also take a lot of planning and strategy too. And I think this is a great way that we can um, have faster finishing times, uh, you know, even when we're under the gun and now, um, you know, within a couple of weeks of your, your, your racing, if you can't get in more miles, maybe you can start to dial in, how is my race planning gonna go? And this is a critical uh, component. So I guess I just wanted to start off um, by asking you, you know, what is the first thing that you think about when you think about coming into an aid station during an ultra marathon? Oh, wow. So I like to be prepared. So I'm going to go in with that a nice checklist for my crew. And so they already know what to do. And I don't really have to think or do anything is what I like to do. How about you? You know, me personally, um, I, I like that you brought in the crew aspect because that's usually not topical on my mind. I've done a lot of um, these races without crews. So I would imagine, you know, the first thing I think about is before I get to an aid station, I think about what do I need, you know? So I'm already trying to stay engaged and in the program. If I know that like, you know, um, the aid station's coming up within a half a mile or sometimes you can hear cowbells going off and people cheering um, before you even get there. That's kind of my mental cue to think, okay, what do I need to get rid of? And what do I need to get on me as soon as possible once I get there? Just because if I can think about that while I'm moving, it cuts down that stopping time at an ultra marathon. But I guess we could back up even further and say, you know, who is going to be at the aid station waiting for you if you have somebody, right? Like what is their plan? So I like that you brought that in. I guess if you could ex expound a little bit more about, you know, like what your, uh, what your strategy for aid stations are with your crew. Right. So my, my strategy is to get in and out as quickly as I possibly can. So um, I put together a list prior to a race um, for my crew to be able to see all of the things that I may or may need during um, an aid station stop. And of course, I have everything very labeled so people can find things quickly and they're not like, you know, digging around for things. And I my goal is, is that I just hand them my stuff, which will be my empty water bottles, my wrappers and collect new things and, and refill. Even if there's some leftover in my bag of snacks or whatever, I give them that and I, I get a new bag and I also get a new bottle. And it's a good way too for my crew to be able to monitor how much I ate or drank during that segment. So, um, but I, I don't really like to have to think. I try to tell my crew to you know keep 
choices down to two because especially late in the race, it's too hard to make decisions. And if you have too many options, it's just a little bit overwhelming. So if I can get in and out of an aid station and you know, a couple of minutes, that's ideal um, or less, uh, because what I want to do is hand them the bottles, they're putting it in my vest, I'm grabbing my stuff, and I just keep moving. I'm not standing there eating, I'm moving through and eating as I get through the aid station, because it just takes so much time to stand there and eat or drink. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you're pretty dialed in as far as, um, you know, having a little bit of choice. So that way, you know, you you have this flexibility of like, do I want the gummy? Do I want the gel? Do I want the drink mix? Do, do I need some salt? Like whatever it is, but it's not so much that you're scanning through and saying, do I want the Oreos? Do I want the Cheez-Its? Do I want the pretzels? Maybe I want some watermelon. There's a couple bananas. Hey, can you make me a peanut butter tortilla? You know, so like sometimes, um, you know, I, I think it's called decision fatigue. When we have so many options available to us, we're like, ah, oh, Evan, I just don't even know what I want, you know? Right, so, exactly. and I think aid stations can be a great opportunity to have all those things to have a comfortable race, right? But um, sometimes when we have to think about what we need too much, it, it kind of makes you stall out a little bit. Compounding that is going to be like, say, if you're at the end of a race, you're fatigued, maybe you're a little bit bonky. All of a sudden you're scanning the table and you're looking and you're like, I don't even know what I'm looking for now. You know? Yeah. You don't know. So, what you <laughs> mm -hmm. yep, for so sure. how, how did you find out what works for you in an aid station as far as food and hydration? Like, where did that come from? So I think a lot of trial and error, you know, looking back at my very first hundred, you know, I ran Hennepin hundred and I just had a great fun day. So I spent a lot of time at aid stations singing and dancing and, you know, there's different ways, right. Depending on what you want from that race. That was my first race and I was going for a finish and, you know, enjoyed it. But then when I went on to run my next um, hundred a year later, when I ran tunnel Hill, I knew what I needed to do to make changes so I could improve my overall finish time. And, and at that point I was, you know, I had a different purpose. I knew I could run a hundred. So now I'm really going to dial in on any little aspect I can to make it faster. So um, trying the different kind of things out on runs is what I've done. I mean, I've tried a lot of different things over the years um, to see what combinations are good. I think it's really good to practice those things on runs because it's better to ruin a long run than it is to entire race. You know, so if, if your stomach's going to go bad, let's have it go bad on the long run. And so I do that. I've also worked closely with some dietitians that have also helped me with kind of exploring some things that work well for me. So um, each race, I feel like I per perfected a little bit more. And, and that's just kind of how I've done it. I prefer to bring my own things. I mean, there'll be occasionally I'll take something off an aid station, but I like to have my own stuff because I have it all separated. So I know how many calories everything is. And so when I'm putting it in my mouth, I'm being like, okay, that was 25 calories. You know, I mean, I know, or hundred you know, calories, whatever it is, I know how much is going in and that's helpful in helping me maintain the amount of calories I need an hour. And, and I think that's the other thing is practicing different amount of calories. You know, they say average 200 to 300 calories per hour. Well, where are you at in that average? And, you know, and, mm -hmm. and kind of playing around with how much your stomach can handle and what that does for your energy. How about you? How do you, how have you decided? That is fantastic. I like a couple things that you said, especially um, one is practice with the um, with the food and with the equipment that you plan on using at an aid station, right? That kind of goes to that adage of, you know, don't try anything new on race day, right? Like you arrive to the race and like, you know, they have Oreos on the table and like, maybe you're like, you know, 50 K into like a, a, a 50 mile or hundred K or whatever. And you're kind of bonky and you're like, oh man, Oreos seem super good right now. But if you've never practiced it in training, it's kind of a shot in the dark. Is it going to ruin your stomach? Is it, it might be very pleasing to your taste buds. It might kind of give you a little bit more energy, but is it in the long term going to benefit you once you get down the trail? Um, so I think that's huge. And another thing that you said too, I think is just that preparation piece of like, okay, what type of aid station is available to me? Right. Cause you have done these um, events such as the 24 hours and six days in the dome, um, which is for anybody that's not familiar, it's where you're running, around basically a big track. So you're passing your own table aid station. You can set it up however you want to. So Loretta um, went and basically counted her gummy bears to see, you know, like how many are gonna be in about hundred calories or in 50 calories and had those in cups. So that way all she has to think about is, okay, it's been 30 minutes. I've only had one cup of gummy bears. 
I need another cup because that'll be 100 calories for the first 30 minutes or whatever your strategy is. You can modify that to what you need. Um, so that's huge. Um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of counting our calories in day to day life. I think that, you know, like our nutrition out of the run should be enjoyable. It should be sustainable. It should be healthful. Um, and to me, sometimes, um, you know, recommending people count all their calories and weigh everything is just kind of an extra stress on what should be a pleasing experience. So when we're talking counting calories, we're just talking about our race fuel. Um, so, you know, my, my thoughts on all that is I think that is really great. And that's amazing if you can control those variables. And I think it comes down to, you know, like, if you're taking gels, knowing how much is in each gel, um, how many calories, just because you can take a spring energy gel or you can take a goo gel and one might have 110 calories, one might have 120. I think humans have some like 200 and something calorie gels. So you kind of have to be like a little bit aware um, just so that way when you're out training, you can say like, oh, during my long runs, I feel really good when I have around 300 calories an hour. Right, now, right. it's probably not a good idea to have all those 300 calories at one point during the hour, right? But that's when we can start to say like, okay, maybe I take a gel at 20 minutes in, a gel at 40 minutes in, and then one at the top of the hour, and that's about 300, you know? Right. Um, so I think that preparation is big. So that way, when you get to an aid station, you kind of have an idea on like, okay, between now and the last aid station, what have I eaten? How long has it been? And how much should I pack on me? Um, whenever I go into an aid station, I'm always thinking, do I have trash in my hand ready to throw away? Do I have um, lids to my bottles unscrewed, ready to give to somebody? And also, how much further is it to the next aid station? If we're doing a point to point race, like those aid stations might be five miles apart, they might be 10 miles apart. And what type of terrain are we operating on? If we're running in the mountains, if we have a five mile stint, but that five miles is going to be all uphill with 5,000 feet elevation gain, it's not going to be like, you know, running a road five mile or whatever. So it's, there's going to be more time out there. So I think about thinking, um, thinking about food in terms of time is huge. Okay. This five mile section is going to take me about like three hours because it's all uphill. Right? So that means if I'm taking 300 calories an hour, I should pack around 900 calories on me. Couple gels, couple, um, savory foods to please the mouth. Um, maybe a little bit of drink mix. Um, and, and then uh, like all of that's going on in my brain before I even get to the aid station. Cause by the time I get to the aid station, I just want to click into gear and say, I need this, 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 and this, and then go. And that way too, like if you have a little bit of brain fog on you, which like is definitely apparent during a lot of these races, you know, like you go through these highs and lows of, of just your mood and your mental state and your energy. Um, so if you're going through this kind of foggy period where math just might be a little bit hard for you, I don't know about you, but even if I'm not running, sometimes math is really hard for me. Yes. <laughs> um, it gives you a little bit more time to think like, oh, okay, am I, am I doing that right? Am I, am I taking enough calories? So you can kind of guess and second check yourself um, just so that way when you get to the aid station, you can execute accordingly. Um, right. And if you, have, if you have a crew, that's amazing because then, you know, they can, they can then triple check you, you <laughs> yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the thing I, I have appreciated having a crew and I'm fortunate enough to have one that's, you know, my, and my crew is pretty experienced because a lot of them have done this races with me. And mm -hmm. so, you know, in my list, I'm also thinking that I prepare ahead of the race is, okay, what about what aid station am I going to need a headlamp, you know, or what aid station may I might ne need more of clothes or what aid station might I need to start um, some cooling strategies, you know, depending on what the race is. So that I had that all prepared for my crew, my crew know, knows. So I necessarily don't have to be thinking about that and spending a lot of energy worrying about those things they're just taking care of me as I come through. So, you know, I think with having a crew, you know, that that's what, what's worked for me. But I think when we don't have a crew, then we have to figure out how we can utilize the aid station, help, you know, volunteers to help you as much as possible, because that's what they're there for. And that's what they want to do. Right. So if you can come in and quickly say, hey, I need um, my ice hat filled and they'll fill it up, you know, or I need, will you please fill this bottle? You know, whatever they're taking care of you. And that's, you know, because sometimes even when I have a crew, I come across aid stations that my crew is not. They're not at every single aid station. So, you know, having that and feeling comfortable with saying to the aid station crew that you need help is going to get you in and out of that aid station so much faster. I think that is huge for sure. Um, aid station volunteers, love you guys. You guys are salt of the earth. Like definitely make the race happen. 
love it but anywhere else that i've ever volunteered before they put you to work you know so i've never volunteered for something and you know haven't been packaging up food to deliver or cooking food for you know the homeless or scrubbing dishes um after people have been eating or whatever it is um volunteers are there to help you on race day so definitely be grateful be gracious use your manners as best as you can sometimes it's not always possible when we're under a lot of physical duress um but as long as you can treat them well um put them to work you know like i i love taking off the uh, tops of my bottles and sometimes people are running with you before the aid station because they're just super excited to greet you in right so like maybe that's a great time to already have your bottle lid off toss it to an aid station or maybe you don't even have the bottle lid off but okay. toss it to an aid station worker tell them what you need um you know ask where the garbage cans are um a lot of people will be asking you things too so um you know kind of have some sort of response ready in your head i've gotten questions where you know like at at hennepin where it's like you know you stop at an aid station and you you're filling up water and in your head you're like i just need this water but nobody else knows that so aid station right. volunteers are like hey do you do you need this do you need that do you need this and it's like if I'm really bonked out, it's just like, Too much. it's just like, I can't. So like my standard go-to is just no thanks, no thanks, no thanks, no thanks. Yeah. Sometimes I won't even look at people in the eyes. It's just like, if I hear something and I don't need it, no thanks, you know? Um, so it's not to be rude or anything, but sometimes you're so focused on other things that um, they don't know what you need. They don't know what you don't, um, right. but put them to work, you know? Um, right. Ask them how far it is to the next aid station. Ask them, um, you know, what's the terrain like up ahead if, if they know, you know? Is it flat? Is it hilly? Is it downhill? Just so that you can be then mentally prepared if you haven't already scouted out the course ahead of time. So they can be they, great yeah. resources. And they can be, and a lot of them are experienced as well. And so they can actually help you troubleshoot if you're having some issues, maybe, you know, you're maybe low on some sodium or, or whatever, and they can help you, you know, get some foods like to get some in you if you, you know, need a little bit of help too. So. Yep, absolutely. Um, you can even use them to judge competition. Um, you know, like say, you know, at looped races, you can like wherever you're at, you know, if you're somewhere up near the front or in the back or whatever it is, if you don't know who's behind you or not, you can tell them like, Hey, keep an eye out for next place. I'm going to do another loop and just let me know where they were at, you know, so you can kind of judge like how far back somebody is. And a lot of times too, like, even if you're doing a point to point, people will know because the aid stations talk to each other. So right. they'll be able to tell you like, Hey, like so-and-so is five minutes behind you, you know, and you got to take some of that information with a grain of salt and not let it like freak you out, go back to your mm -hmm. mental skills and, you know, practice patience and practice execution and all that. Um, and sometimes too, if you're chasing somebody down, you can say like, Hey, when did he leave? You know, um, running kettle, there was a, there was a brief stint where I was running with somebody and he was feeling pretty good come like 30 miles in. And he, I was like, Hey man, if you want to leave, go for it. Um, we were running pretty fast and he just kind of zipped ahead and, you know, for the next couple hours, all I heard was he's five minutes ahead. He's five minutes ahead. He's five <laughs> minutes ahead. And all of a sudden I heard he's four minutes ahead. He's three minutes ahead. You got him. He's looking bad, you know? Um, <laughs> So they can be great resources like that too. But again, you can't let that like put a ton of wind in your sails. You can't let that like really dog you down too much because anything can happen in these ultra marathons, right? For but sure. we can use that information to just enhance some of the decisions that we make um, right. in a race. Right, I agree. So the other thing, another thing that I kind of think about when I'm going between aid stations is how, you mentioned it a little bit about how much to carry. I like to go as light as possible, especially on the hydration. You know, I have it calculated about how much I need. And I've done that through doing sweat loss tests, you know, during my um, training runs. And I have a pretty good idea of how much I need to replace. And so I carry as little as possible because it, it can get heavy and you're carrying extra weight isn't worth it. Not, not to me anyway. So, so I, I, I have that and I usually have um, seconds of you know, like doubles of all of my water bottles and stuff. So I can just be handed a fresh one with, you know, whatever I want. And so that, that works well for me. Yeah. And I guess too, it goes back to like, what are your goals for the race? Like if you're trying to be competitive, then maybe you take a little gamble and try to go as light as possible. Right. Like, um, I was running Wasatch last year and, um, I had a total of one liter of water up on my, my vest here. And then I carried another collapsible water bottle that could hold about 16 ounces, thinking that that would be my backup in case I like got really thirsty at an aid station or ran out of water because I never like to guzzle a bunch at once. Right. right. So um, there were definitely a lot of points during that race where I was like, 
shit, if I wouldn't have had this extra water capacity, like I would have been absolutely dying. And again, like I didn't know exactly how the altitude would hit me. I didn't know exactly what the course conditions would be like. I know that the highs would be in the nineties and the lows would be in the forties. Um, but you know, you never really know how it hits you. So there are options to at least being able to carry the capacity if you don't carry the water on you all at once, because all I had to do is just shrink that thing down and tuck it in the pack I was carrying anyways, you know? So you don't have to carry it all at once, but um, you know, if you're doing these races that are gonna take a lot and you're gonna be battling the elements, I like to personally err on the side of having more capacity, even if I don't use it. Mm -hmm. um, for other races, say if I know, you know, like, um, been running out in Illinois here, racing out, going to be racing out in Illinois. I kind of have an idea on like, okay, how much water do I need on me at a time and how, how slim can I get with that? So I think coming down to that strategy is, is huge too. You don't have to fill your bottles up all the way at every aid station too. I know if you're doing handhelds and it's going to be a fast race and you're going back and forth, um, you know, like aid stations aren't too far apart. Um, sometimes having like two very full water bottles sucks, but if they're both half full, at least you have like the same amount of weight on each arm. Um, you know, and it's not, uh, kind of like lopsided or really tiring out your arm carriage too much. Yep. I agree. I guess the other thing that I would mention is the chair of death. <laughs> Stay away from it. <laughs> you know, there's always chairs sitting around, you know, begging us to sit on them when we come to an aid station, but man, that can really take some time away. The minute you sit down, things start to tighten up. Then it's, you start feeling everything. And then it's hard to get up out of that chair and moving again. Have you ever sat in a chair? Oh my gosh. No, uh, not, not, dur not during a race. Absolutely yeah. not. But, um, during training for sure. I mean, one thing that I did, um, in preparation for nuclear meltdown a couple years ago, um, and for those not familiar, it's a 12 hour race. Every hour you run 4.1 something miles. Um, winner is based on who makes it to the 12th hour and has the fastest lap. So you kind of have to get to the end within a race as hard as you can at the end for, um, that very final lap. So what I would do is I would go out for like 20, 25 mile training runs. And then specifically for 20 minutes, I would just sit down in a chair and let everything tighten up because I knew that like come that 11th hour, I would be running and then have to wait for like 20 or 30 minutes before I then busted out a really hard four mile. So um, just from that experience alone, I can tell you that if you're standing and at least walking around just a little bit and keeping things moving, it's a heck of a lot better than when you just sit still. Um, sure. But with that being said, too, that's something that you can also train your ability to kind of rebound back from a tighter position, right? Because sometimes I think it's easy to think that our body gets tight and it'll never kind of shake out or loosen up again, right? But, okay. um, you know, say, let's say it's some leg swings or it's, you know, like kind of like light squats or light lunges or um, like step overs with your, with your hips, just to kind of keep them loose and limber. That's a great idea to practice in some of your training runs. Cause I know during a lot of our training runs, you know, like we're not going out and busting out 20 miles and having zero stop breaks. Right. So maybe you go out and you do five or 10 and then you practice having like a five or 10 minute refuel at the car and just kind of sit around, maybe sit down for like five or 10 minutes and just see what it's going to feel like. Just having that experience of knowing that my body can lock up and that I can still kind of loosen it up down the trail is, um, is huge because you won't get demoralized if it ever right. happens in a race. Yeah. yeah. My so. first 12 hour race, um, I, you know, I was very inexperienced, didn't really know how to approach the race. It was a four mile loop. And mm -hmm. the idea was, to, was decided that I would stop every lap sit in the chair, get a massage, then go. <laughs> bad, bad, bad decision. Mm -hmm. It was in the thirties or, or maybe lower than 30 at the start of the race. So, you know, on top of stopping, it was cold. And so, you know, I do this loop and it was wasting so much time. And I was, my goal was to get the course record. So I, I was really watching time and, and miles. Right. And so finally I, my my crew and I came to the decision at the same time, like, this is a terrible idea. I'm just going to walk on through these aid stations because, you know, I would get an aid station every loop with my crew. And uh, it was much better because what was happening is that four mile loop was taking me like a mile and a half to move again every time I stopped. And I felt like, oh, I just get going and then it was time to stop again. So, so yeah, yeah. definitely not a good strategy. <laughs>
Yep. I think even walking is, is more therapeutic because it keeps everything warm. It keeps everything pliable. You're moving through pretty well. A lot of these aid stations too, like they're not super contained. Like they're kind of spread out a little bit down the trail. Like you'll have one table over here. You'll have another table over here. So if you're at a walking pace, you can even tell people like, Hey, I need a bot, you know, like this in my bottle. Like, can somebody toss me a package of gummy worms and you can still continue to walk. And then volunteers will be like, Oh shoot, go run it over to them. You know? So, yeah. um, that's, that's a way to tackle it for sure. But yeah, I think complete like stoppage is really tough. Mm -hmm. I would rather take my breaks hiking up hills, um, than, you know, completely not moving, not you know? Yeah. So, um, I guess, you know, to recap coming into an aid station, like personally for me, I think, what do I need to get rid of? What do I need to grab before I even get to the aid station? Um, so that's going to look like getting the trash in my hand, because if I get trash in my hand, I'm not going to forget to throw it away. Sometimes I'll think to myself, like throw away your trash. And then it never happens because it's not like obstructing me some way. Um, and then think about how many calories you need. Think about how far the next aid station is going to be for you. And then as you get to the aid station, you'll kind of have those things jogged in, in your memory and you'll just be able to grab and go and continue down the trail. Right. Um, if you have crew bonus, because they'll be able to help you switch bottles, switch packs, fill you up, know exactly what you need. You won't have to direct anybody. Um, but yeah, if you're going in without a crew, use those volunteers because they're there and they want to help you. If you're going to use the volunteers, be polite, you know? Um, thank you, volunteers. <laughs> yeah, thank you, guys. Um, so do you have anything else to add to that? I think we we kind of gave a really good summary on what we particularly so, yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I just have a, um, a couple of things. So I do have a race day um, um, checklist that's on our ordering meal website. So you can go through and it can kind of give you some ideas and you can see how I prep my aid, my crew and and the containers that I bring so that I can get through aid stations quickly. I think that's helpful. Um, Coach Reese also on our webpage has a, a blog on race day efficiency, which can also give you more information um, that we've talked about today. And then I also think like if you're gonna use anything at an aid station, let's say you have a hypervolt or um, a roller or you know different foam roller, whatever you might think you might need, make sure you practice it during your training runs too, because they can impact you a little bit differently, especially heavy into the miles. Um, I know I, when I was racing desert solstice, the idea was to try, because my calves were getting tight, was to try um, the hypervolt. That was way too much pressure for me at that point. At that point in the race, I really should have just had a gentle massage. So, you know, thinking about that ahead of time, if you're going to be going through and trying to use any kind of tools to help you out that you've practiced it. Wonderful. I guess before we transition to the next topic, um, you know, I do want to add to like that, just practice with it, whatever it is, if it's, if it's nutrition, if it's some sort of tool that you're going to use. And I'm super glad that you brought that up Loretta, because I, that I didn't even think about that. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Even practice with those hypervolts practice with, um, any type of movements that you might do. I know, um, I was on an adventure with a buddy of mine who, uh, we were in the grand Canyon and his hamstrings started to tighten up a little bit and he would stop every like five miles or so and just hold a static stretch. And he told me afterwards, he goes, man, I don't even really know if that really like worked too well. Cause now I like my legs just feel like jelly and they hurt. And so that, that may or may not even be a good option for you to do too. So, um, whatever you strategize your plan to be, give it a shot, just like anything else. Yeah. Um, but the next topic, I do want to talk about like the unmanned aid station because it is there for aid, but it may or not, may not be your saving grace. So what do you think about unmanned aid stations? So, I mean, I, I often have not used them, but it is nice if there's a jug of water there and you're, you know, needing some water. And so it's nice to be able to have, but also, you know, maybe not always count on because I may not have any, you know, what you need there because it's usually just water. Yeah, absolutely. In my experience, it might be, it's definitely water. Uh, it may or may not have any um, drink supplies that the race is offering, like, you know, gnarly or anything else. Um, and then you're hard pressed to know if it's going to have granola bars or other snacks. Some of them do, some of them don't. So I guess in my race preparation, I will look and see where the manned aid stations are and 
um, make my strategy based off of that and then take the unmanned ones kind of as like a bonus, right? Like if I'm running low on water, I'm in the middle of the woods and all of a sudden, boom, there's a couple of jugs of water, like fill it up so I don't get dehydrated, you know, but don't count on, on it being there for you for sure. Um, so they can always be a little bit sparse, definitely welcomed if you get a nice one and you know, like you, you uh, don't have any water on you, but, um, I try never to plan on them. Right. Right. I think, you know, the other thing is, is making sure, um, when you're maybe you, maybe we're not to this point, but making sure that, you know, the stations that your crew can be at or cannot be at is another thing that I think we should talk about because if your crew shows up at a spot that says no crews allowed, I mean, you could risk the chance of being disqualified and you certainly don't want to make that happen. Um, so making sure you go to the website of the race that you have, and I know definitely the ornery meal races have them all listed out very well with each um, aid station checkpoint and all of the GPS coordinates. And then it says crew or no crew. And so you really want to make sure you know that and highlight that with your, with your crew, if you have a crew coming. Absolutely. And 99% of the time, um, you know, crew access or crew denial is based on the crew's level of safety, maybe yep. the parking capacity that's there, um, as well as um, the impact that it has to the forest. Like a lot of these trail runs are going to be in, you know, either national parks or state parks or protected forests. So if there's no crew access to some place, it probably means there's not a lot of parking there. So you might not even really want to take your car down there in the first place. Right. Or if you do go down, you may be risking um, taking a spot that an aid station volunteer might need, right? Um, so yeah, you know, being prepared and making sure that your crew is legitimate in, in being someplace is huge. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. So I guess, you know, how are the ways that you practice? Like, do you, do you ever do aid station practice in training? Like, you know, personally, I love using my car as an aid station. I know other people have set up like tables and chairs for themselves just to kind of go through their strategy. Do you think it's worthwhile? Do you think um, it's it, it can help somebody? Do you ever practice doing that yourself? Sure, I do. I often will, there's a looped course near me that's just under three miles and I will run that with my car parked by and you know, then I can stop and I can get all of my supplies that I need. And I and it helps me, it makes it easier to try different foods because it's hard to carry some of the stuff that I might not be carrying on race day, but I might have with my crew or whatever. And so I can try that. I, I think that that's really helpful for me too. And then trying things out like, okay, if you think you're gonna take drink Coke um, at a like halfway point of the race, making sure you try it or something I use is chocolate milk, you know, so I know that all of that's going to work well on race day. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And you can even like, personally, I use my car all the time and bonus to any trails that have parking that are really close to the trail. Like sometimes you hit this parking spot and you have to kind of like run in a little bit on a connector trail to finally get to your trail, especially in the ice age. Um, but you know, if the parking lot, like at veteran acres is basically going to be the start and finish line of your next race or any other type of park, um, it would definitely be worthwhile just to um, park there and kind of use that as your marker because you can carry that stuff on you. You can kind of get yourself prepared for, oh, when I get to this last leg of the race, I should start thinking about like, okay, my car is coming up. What do I need? So that way you kind of condition yourself in the middle of the race. You get to that same section. You're like, oh, okay, I'm going to get really close to what would be my car, but is the start finish line. So let's start to think about this stuff. Right. Um, you can even use it furthermore for like, um, for gear strategy, you know, like if you're, if you're like, I don't know if I'm going to carry, you know, um, handhelds or just a waist pack or maybe um, a vest, at least it's a safe option to say like, okay, I'm going to pack my vest just in case I need it. But Maybe I'll try going a little bit lighter on water that way. Like I know that at worst case scenario, I'm only ever five miles away from the right. vehicle, right? So you can kind of start to titrate in your strategy that way. Right. I agree. Yep, definitely. I mean, practice is always great before a race. So you have some ideas. It takes a little bit of the anxiety away by, you know, practicing those skills and, and improving upon them before race day actually comes. Yep. And I guess that too, I do want to clarify because it can almost sound a little neurotic as we talk about this and saying that <laughs> you need to practice, you need to practice, you need to practice, you need to practice. Right. But I mean, like, there's no reason why one or two runs during a buildup for that race, um, you know, couldn't, uh, couldn't have this aid station type of like specific practice, right? Yeah. Like 
I'm a huge fan of just going out and enjoying the woods, like any way that you see fit, going out and enjoying your run any way that you see fit. But if one or two times um, during like an eight or 12 week buildup, if we can do like a long run where, you know, you're a little bit more um, engaged with, okay, I'm going to practice how I want to race. Mm -hmm. then I think that's huge in experience and will definitely pay dividends in the long run. So you don't have to do it every week, but at some points it would behoove any runner for sure. Right. Right. I agree. So, well, do you have anything else to add to the topic? Well, let's talk about drop bags. Um, how do you prepare drop <laughs> bags? Do you use drop bags? How do you prepare your athletes using those? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's really great. Um, so drop bags for sure. I wouldn't treat them as like, you know, most of the time drop bags are going to be at an aid station, right? So like, as far as I wouldn't like treat them as an aid station, like I wouldn't pack like all of my food and all of my drinks and whatnot in an aid station personally, um, or in, in a drop bag at an aid station, because they're going to have those foods with them. Personally, what I would do is I would go onto the, onto the race website and just see what types of foods that they're going to be providing at each aid station. So that way you can say, okay, what foods do I like? So that way I don't have to carry them and I don't have to pack them. And if you can devise your strategy based on, on that, then you don't have to, you know, put a load of gummy worms in your drop bag, you know, at every couple miles because you really want them during the race or, or whatnot. Um, I see a drop bag as more of a transition during a period of a race. Like let's say um, most of the time I've used drop bags have been um, going from a light to dark condition, especially if I'm going a little bit lighter weight, like I'm only using bottles and a waistband. I don't want to carry my light on me. I want that shuttled to mile 60 or whatever it is in a hundred mile race, just because um, I know then I'm going to be able to pick it up there and then, and then go down the trail where that can bite you in the butt is if you're packing essential gear that you're gonna need and you forget to grab it. Um, this happened to me at Kettle this past year. Uh, Highway 12 has a drop bag um, uh, uh, aid station that you can do. And basically the only thing that I packed in there was my headlamp. And if anybody knows the course, you hit mile 12 and then you still have a little out and back left. And I hit I hit aid station 12, I said mile 12, but aid station, um, Highway 12. Um, I hit that point and then I kept going about another half a mile down the trail before I realized, shit, I forgot my headlamp and it was closing in on dark. So I'm doing these mental calculations in my head like, oh my God, I probably have about 40 minutes to an hour of solid light, but holy crap, this terrain is the most like challenging and technical of the entire race. Am I going to be able to make it? Do I have to push a little bit harder than I was planning on during this section? So that way I don't have to go back. Should I turn back and get my headlamp? So I would just, um, you know, if there's any way that somebody is packing essential gear and you can give yourself a reminder, maybe um, you have a reminder set on your watch, like, you know, at around the time that you should be getting into that aid station, like grab your headlight dummy. Um, right. That would be huge. But otherwise, just rehearsing that in your head and, and being prepared um, would be would be key. So I treat them more as like transitions between like light to dark, maybe if an athlete needs some sort of like pick me up food, like you know, if you love that Butterfingers or Snickers come mile 70 or, or whatnot, um, you can also use those drop bags as a place to exchange gear and then just know that it's going to be back at the, at the, at the car for you. So let's say you're going through the night and then you're coming back out and you're like, okay, well, you know, I have 20 miles to the finish. I don't really need these poles anymore. Maybe I can, you know, like finagle them in my drop bag and not have to carry them because I haven't been using them for the past couple hours. Um, whatever it is, that's, that's how I see a drop bag. Right. So what decision did you make? You like left us a cliff cliffhanger. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I was about a half a mile away from, um, from highway 12, still going. Um, at that point I was leading the race. I, um, thought to myself, you know, like it's definitely a calculated decision, but I think that I can get back to highway 12 by the time it gets too dark to really see. I knew that I would be playing it, um, pretty tight. I already rolled my ankle about 20 times during the day. Um, it was kind of loose going into the race. So I knew that like, ah, man, like I might roll this ankle again on this terrain, but I thought to myself, like, it's kind of worth it because I've already been rolling my ankle so much that it's already super thick and hurts. Um, so with all those calculated decisions, I was like, you know what, let's just gun it to rice, Lake, gun it back, grab the headlight and then, and then flick it on. Um, so that's, that's what I did. It ended up working pretty well, but you got to take into consideration too, that there's points in the Kettle Marine forest where 
the sun might still be out, but it is freaking dark too. So um, you're kind of playing with uh, playing with a little bit of fire and you have to be pretty confident in your strategy. And in, in, if you're choosing to drop essential gear um, at a critical point in the race. Um, so let's say if I would have blown up beforehand and, you know, I wouldn't have gotten to rice or would have gotten to highway 12, like on target, like, who man, maybe I can buddy up with somebody that has a headlamp and try to jog it in with them until I can get my own, you know? So you can, you can race with other people on the race course to, um, I, Sometimes, I mean, that might not be the most polite thing to do because people don't always like to be running with a stranger, but maybe if you can get behind somebody and at least kind of know what the trail is. So long story short, have a backup plan just in case um, you don't hit your mark and you're leaving essential gear in a drop bag. Right. And it, and it worked out for you. And I think in these races, especially, you know, at this point of the race, you were leading and going for the win. And, you know, we take maybe some higher risks at that point of a race, whereas maybe if you weren't in that position, you would have chose to go back and grab the headlamp and, and finish with the headlamp. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, if I would have been carrying a pack too, I might have not even dropped it in a drop bag. Um, I knew that that race can get pretty hot at points. I don't like running with a pack. Um, I would much rather go with handhelds and a, and, and a waistband. Um, so, you know, like I thought to myself, I don't want to carry this thing in my waistband all day and risk the chafage. Um, so with all those calculations, I, you know, it ended up working out in my favor, but it doesn't always right. So those are kind of the gambles that we take, especially when we're racing, especially when we're playing the elements and we're challenging ourselves for sure. Right. For sure. I had an issue with, um, headlamp once too, and that was at Hennepin, my first race. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get a headlamp when I should have. And by the time I got to the next aid station, it was pretty dark. But luckily on Hannah Penn, you know, it's a little bit smoother, not as much um, things that you're going to trip over. And at that point I had, it was late in the race. I didn't have a pacer with me and, and we got through it just fine, but we knew we're like, we're not going to make it before dark. So yeah, plan ahead yep. for the lamps. They, I think those are, you know, you, you always think, oh, it's going to be light a little bit longer and then it's not. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And I guess, you know, since we're talking about headlamps, this is kind of a tangent, but, um, you know, when, so I only have one of those rechargeable batteries for my headlamp. So I used, I, I like to use that one the most when I'm training, but when I'm racing, I'll start with the harder batteries to pop in and pop out. Right. So like with that particular headlamp, it took a couple AAA batteries. So I had those AAA batteries in the headlamp first, because I knew if the headlamp goes out and I need to replace the batteries, it's gonna be a heck of a lot harder trying to align all of those triple A's right. yep. as opposed to taking the rechargeable feeling where the knob is and then clicking that into place and going right. So yep. you can yep. kind of strategize what batteries am I going to start with and stuff like that too. That might be getting really neurotic, but um, you know, in that case, having a small, like dime sized one, just um, in case your main one goes out, you still have some sort of backup light and those things like weigh like a couple ounces if that you know so it's really that would be a great option for anybody that's doing like a challenging um and lengthy race for sure right right so i mean i think overall i think really planning ahead is a good key right looking at the race that you're going to be doing looking where all the rates a stations are going to be how far apart they are the terrain and maybe putting together some notes for yourself or if you have a crew just so you can kind of remember some things that you want to think about during those aid stations, taking a little bit of time and practicing those um, outside of the race and then um, going to the race. I mean, depending on your goal, if your goal is to just go have fun and you're not worried about your finish time, you can go and you can enjoy the aid stations. But if your goal is to take some time off your, your time, then you know, think about how quick can I get in and out of those aid stations and how can I just keep moving forward, whether it's walk, you know, grabbing and walking through, you know, how, how do I make that happen as quickly as possible? anything yep. to add that is that that wrap it no. up <laughs> absolutely that is fantastic um sometimes too in these longer races um to carry a little plastic baggie a little empty plastic baggie is a good idea too it can be your trash baggie it can also be your aid station baggie say um you know if you're running low on food and um you know you know that you're going to want some uh some particular foods later in the race but you don't want to stuff your your mouth um during the aid stations then and we can fill up a little baggie and take that down the trail. So you can take aid station food and not eat it specifically at the aid station, you know? So if you think, hey, maybe in five miles, I might want like a, a peanut butter square or whatever it is, you know, like you can, you can pack that on the go. So that's also another good option. But again, like you said, it all comes down to, did you practice that strategy? Um, is it fluid with you? 
um, by the time it comes to race day, like I kind of just want to click into a rhythm and just get into my usual routine that I've been practicing. So that's huge. Yep. I agree. Awesome. Well, do you have anything else to add to that Loretta or do we I cover think, that topic sufficiently? I think that is all for me. Okay. I will. I didn't get a chance to tell you about my race. So maybe we can just wrap it up with a quick race story. Yeah, exactly. totally. So last weekend, um, I ran the Calhaven Trail Ultra, which runs from Kalamazoo to South Haven, about 33.5 miles. And I ran it with a six-person team. Um, it was a great day. It's, oh, it's always fun to be able to run and um, with a team instead of just being out on your own. Typically, I ran that race solo. Um, and I, at my leg was the fifth leg. So as we're, we started in Kalamazoo, the weather was pretty nice. I was in shorts and a uh, t-shirt with a little light jacket. Well, as we neared uh, South Haven, I layered up. I had a big winter coat. I mean, the weather changed quite a bit. Temperature drop, rain, sleep. I was running into a probably 20 mile per hour winds by the time I hit my leg hit. So yeah, it was a big shift. And um, we were following along. I went ahead to the my stop to go do so I could do some um, warm up before my leg. And so I left my team to the other spot to like time what time the other person came in. So I knew when he would come. So we had it figured out what time we thought he'd be arriving. And so I'm still saying I had warmed up and I was getting in the car sort of staying warm and <laughs> my leg came through. We didn't know he was coming. He was faster than we expected. They're like, the right out. and he just keeps running. <laughs> and I'm in the car away from the trail. And so we had to chase him down the trail to jump on to trail so we could do our relay. <laughs> He's like, oh, I need to slow us down. So he just kept going. But <laughs> it was great. So I almost oh. missed the relay exchange. But uh, then we ended up winning um, overall for the co-ed team this year for the six person co-ed. So it was fun. Oh, fun. congratulations. That's yeah, awesome. Thanks. And what a great way to like, you know, have a good result in the beginning of the year and build that positive momentum. So that's, yeah, that's fantastic. Sure. And I'm sure too, that it's such a unique experience when, um, you know, in this solo type of sport, as it's perceived, we have those group experiences. So I'm, I'm sure that you and your team are celebrating and hooting and hollering and yeah. have a little bit of an extra bonded experience. So that's fantastic. Yeah, it was great fun. Wonderful. Well, I think that is a great wrap up for today. Loretta, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. Um, I can't wait for next week's topic and I can't wait for all the races that are coming up. So um, we got a couple athletes at OMR um, running races this weekend. So just on the podcast, I did want to shout out Dylan in the Chicago area. He's going to be running a half marathon. Um, personal athlete of mine, great kid. He's got a great spirit, great energy. So I'm really excited to see him perform at that one. He's super stoked. I'm stoked. It's a great time. Um, another athlete of mine, his name is Travis. He's going to be running in Salt Lake. Um, he's got a 15 K coming up. So he's dialing in his speed work before transitioning into some longer mountain races out in the Utah area. So those are two uh, athletes of mine that have some good things coming up this week and I can't wait to see him crush it. So it'll yeah, be a fun great time. Luck to Dylan and Travis. Thanks for sharing that coach. Absolutely. Well, you take care. Have a great weekend and uh, we'll talk with you next time. Okay. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.